1.6 billion pounds for three miles of rail with six stations is nuts. Now, I have no that's idea. Bit, I think that's island tax, mate. I think that's an island yeah, tax. Yeah, I was going to say, I have no idea the cost of shipping construction materials, which we assume are not produced on the island, to mm-hmm. the island. So that's going to have a horrible effect. You probably have to relocate a lot of the workforce too. So there's going to be loads of costs that we just wouldn't be able to understand what that looks like. But if you look at London's DLI, it was like one and a half billion. It's pretty expensive. It's like 30, 40 kilometers, 45 stations. It was built in the 80s, but... Yeah, I'm sure if you've done inflation, if you've done inflation adjustment... I did did apply inflation (laughs) and it takes it up to 1.5 billion. I think there's some costs missing there because that's great value. Uh, Almost unbelievable. Welcome back to the Offsite Podcast. Carlos, good to be with you, mate. What's been going on? So pretty cool pro- uh, projects in the news at the moment. Um, and hello to you. I don't know if- <laughs> and hello. Sorry, I thought we were, we were in the zone today. No, um, you see Asiona, they've won a contract to build a hip-hop museum in the Bronx. So I think coolest project ever award uh, has to go to them. What's the size of this hip-hop? Hip-hop museum? Yeah, hip-hop museum in the Bronx obviously New York, one by Asiona. I can't remember. I think it was like 15,000 square feet, uh, which I don't know how many football pitches that is, but uh, I've got a football pitch reference later for you, so I won't ruin it now. Put that on the yeah, holiday. Pretty cool. I think that put that on the holiday list. Sorry, yeah. I just started Googling hip hop museums. Uh, yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah. And then the other one was um, Disney have committed to extending their Florida and California theme parks. The Florida one alone is 17 billion, 15,000 acre expansion. So, wow. yeah. So, in- the old, uh, that definitely brings back memories of Roller Coaster Tycoon and thinking about how you'd lay that, uh, yeah. you'd lay that <laughs> expansion. Get <Yeah. laughs> the old crab and drop people into the lake. Yeah. And the, tr- <laughs> well, the trick is to like, you cut off the roads uh, so people couldn't leave. And then you just put a million uh, umbrella stores and then wait for it to rain and put the price <laughs> up to the maximum. And that is the, Cash in. that is, <laughs> and yeah, you learn a lot of business lessons out of, uh, out of roller coaster tycoon. That is, um, that is capitalism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't let them leave, get them in, make yeah. it rain. And, and then you have the ghosts playing about, don't you? When everyone dies because you don't like people food people die that you, yeah i don't i didn't i never without the food vendors they hey, i thought die. i i thought i was bad getting them in there without <laughs> without uh without a way to get out but i at least gave them food and toilets i'll talk to my uh, therapist about it <laughs> there, there's a side note there's some uh there was an interesting conversation the other week uh a few with a, with a few of the team members talking about what they used to do in the sims there's some yeah, really yeah. sadistic shit that goes on in the sims <laughs> But I won't name names. I think my wife was one of those sadistic people, but we're not going to get I, I gave you an opportunity then to just like move on topic and then you just name dropped your <laughs> wife. So um, cool. We got some interesting, with three interesting topics to chat through today as a sort of jumping off point. So first of all, we've got the opening of the first uh, section of Sydney Metro in Australia, uh, which has been all over the news here, which we can uh, dive into. Then we have been talking a bunch internally about, again, uses of AI, but this one's super exciting. The company Document Crunch, a US company raised money earlier this year, looking at what they can do has got us pretty excited. Uh, and then final one is the, I think probably the the project that everyone wants to go on um, is going to be the new section of the Honolulu Rail Transit Project that's been awarded, a $1.6 billion project that's just been awarded in the US. So we might be seeing some transfers uh, requests going in. Yeah, that would be a pretty nice one. You'd work all day and surf all evening, I'd imagine. Or the other, uh, other yeah, way around. yeah. So yeah, sign up to the night shift. <laughs> so off the bat, uh, City Metro. So uh, at about 5 a.m. this Monday, just gone as we were recording, the first section of the new City Metro network was open to the public. Uh, a 15 and a half kilometer section from Chatswood to Sydenham was expected or is expected to handle around 34,000 passengers an hour during peak travel times. And it's the first of two sections in the second stage of the, the massive $64 billion mega project. This is Australia's biggest ever infrastructure investment. Uh, in watching 
uh, you might not have seen it as much over there. I don't know if you, you have, Carlos, but in watching the the news, I was getting a lot of vibes of the opening of Crossrail where people were really excited to start to finally be able to get on there recording videos going through there um and and for people that worked on it the ability to finally see uh something that you contributed to being used and enjoyed i think in the first day 190,000 people rode on on this section oh wow um so yeah it reminded me a lot of the opening of of crossrail and and seeing people really yeah enjoying a piece of infrastructure that was delivered yeah when you spend that many years working on Obviously, it looks like a single project. When you're in the job, it feels like a series of projects mm-hmm. that you work on over a period of time, but it all sort of builds up to that moment. So, yeah, it must have been awesome for anyone that's working on it. For people like me that doesn't really know Sydney, so is this a north to south line, a bit like London's northern line, I guess, going down no, towards the airport? It's it's like much more significant. So it is the overall scheme of Sydney Metro actually involves four separate lines. So there's a Metro North West line, which is yep. um, which a large section of which was opened 2019. So even though this was yep. touted as the opening, there was actually a section that was opened a number of years ago. But this section is the first bit that kind of goes across the city, um, yep. which okay. has been the most significant part of the investment. Uh, then there is a, a metro city and southwest line, which is what this is part of. Yep. Then there is a metro west line, which goes out towards the western suburbs. And then a metro western Sydney airport line, which is a, a, out in the far western suburbs. And the new connects, airport. Connects to the new airport, yeah. The northwest line is now, I think, almost totally open as part of this then the city and southwest is partially open as part of this opening there is another section of city and southwest to be still worked on and opened i think next year and then metro west and the western sydney airport sections are currently under construction um with big tunneling packages underway for for the western uh for metro west and then the tunneling uh, the uh the stations package is underway for the western sydney airport so the overall scheme is 46 stations across four lines and 113 kilometers of new track. Yeah, it's pretty impressive value for money. And I'm about to tie value for money back to a British project, which isn't always the strongest hand to play. But um, yeah, very similar because uh, Crossrail was what, 42 stations. This, this is 46, very similar. Over 100 kilometers of track, again, very similar and about two thirds of the cost. So um, yeah. Allegedly. It's, uh, Crossrail, at least you've crossrail. We've got the final bill, or there or thereabouts. Yeah, true. You have got another section, although the final section is due next year. Uh, no, I think the um, the final section of the city and southwest line is due next year, but the overall Sydney Metro, there, I think they're planning to award later this year the stations packages for the Metro West, and those stations will be a number of years themselves. So I think there's still a few years to go. Yeah, okay. But the 21.6 billion, that is the current forecasted total cost of uh so alleged, we, yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah, reported somewhere uh, at some point. I'm sure someone listening to this will have a, a probably more accurate uh, view of what that is really. You know when we yeah, were working okay. on Crossrail, the I recall very clearly sitting in meetings looking at forecast final costs of projects that were multiples of what was being publicly reported at the time so i'm sure someone has uh more <laughs> accurate information than we've gotten from the news uh, no, no comment on the old crossfire forecasts um, <laughs> but, uh is there, yeah. i think um, statute of limitations maybe yeah <laughs> not a lawyer yeah yeah, yeah. easier to stay quiet that and this is to reduce congestion on roads presumably because there's not sort of a massive tube lines and, and rail systems throughout the city center yeah, it's uh, one of the hardest places to commute in Australia is from the western suburbs and, and certain suburbs of Sydney into the city. Uh, and so, yeah, definitely getting people off roads. On top of big road projects, the, in recent years, they opened uh, the West Connects, which is a big road tunnel project yeah. as well. So there's a huge amount of investment. It was the congestion in Sydney is and, and was horrific uh, for people to be able to get to work. Yeah, okay. And obviously, it's pulling people in from the two airports as well. So that'd be the quickest way to get into the city, you'd imagine. We'll have to correct this if I'm wrong, but I can't. I, 
Yeah, there is a rail line from the airport, uh, from the current airport, definitely from the new airport. Yes, I can't recall. I've never gotten the airport, the train from the current airport. I was going to say that's because Australia has the best Uber system in the world, where it actually manages. Or is that just Melbourne? Uh, no, you, you know, mean when you the, come like, the airport? It yeah, gives you yeah, a yeah. number, and then yeah, you walk yeah, up the... to the first car, and you're not like, "Where's this guy running around the car park?" Uh, yeah, yeah, anyway, 100%. We're going off track. But certainly the. Um, Getting to see people enjoying the piece of infrastructure, getting to observe that as someone that worked on it was that just immediately brought me back to uh, the opening of Crossrail, which was a tremendous feeling. And then the excitement of getting to actually ride on it uh, the first time. And I did the like classic thing that everyone um, probably did, which is take family members onto this uh, train and be like, this this was a problem in this part of the project. And then here we did this. And they're like, cool story. And, I, <laughs> yeah. th- and then they're like, after, after like half an hour of a walkthrough of the project, they're like, oh, this train has air conditioning. That's nice. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I had the oh, same thing. The train has um, Wi-Fi. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> on, uh, on Paddington. They're these huge, they must be like five by five meter precast panels on the ceiling. Yeah. And they're these like curved domes, which has a light. So I was like, oh, this, like there was huge issues with actually getting those into place and, and actually casting them. And I remember saying that and the response I got was, that's a lampshade. I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, there's Wi-Fi on the train. Let's go. <laughs> 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 it's just really hard to get people caring about all the problems that you sweated over for like five years. Yeah, um, it, the, yeah. I think the the it's the ultimate satisfaction in construction, getting to observe people nonchalantly using something that you've uh, slaved over for many years as though it yeah. is like just part of their everyday life. Yeah, yeah. My favorite <laughs> thing is when I go back, I went through the station the other day with an engineer who I worked with on that project. And all I have to say is we built that and it triggers the engineer so hard to be like, what do you mean you built that? <laughs> you didn't build anything. And yeah, <laughs> job done. The Jumping on to the next topic, earlier this year, a US startup called Document Country Company uh, in, the, in the construction technology space raised about 9 million US dollars in funding for a product that takes a kind of amalgamates construction, AI and contract and and kind of legal uh, review. It was something that I had observed and watched and I recently listened to another podcast where they were talking about it in more detail. I probably should shout out the Bricks and Bytes podcast. It just got me thinking massively about if I was a construction engineer on a project today, how much I would be totally enamored with this product. And so we can definitely dive into that. And then on the flip side, um, thinking about it from the perspective of, you know, as a startup, the idea of how sustainable, how defensible is the product that they're they're building. So on, I guess on the first side, what the product does is allows teams to upload or connect legal documents from construction, so scopes of work, contracts, uh, and it will help crunch those documents like risks and opportunities, understanding positions. I had read that the plan is to be able to connect it in certain ways to the field through integrations with things like Procore. So it can help identify in the field from, I don't know, maybe if you imagine a workflow, someone completes a site diary, which has a record in it that then might trigger a right or an obligation or an action that needs to be taken to be able to help them spot that and take that action. The list of opportunities there is somewhat endless. And all I could think about was a project that I'd worked on many years ago where we, I guess one of the things that happens in construction is that clients have a lot of power in the process of contracting, usually depending on the the state of the market. And they kind of push quite onerous conditions on the contractor who really wants to to win the the project. And so the contract is left with these fairly onerous head contract, prime contract uh, terms. And then they, in turn, generally, they're not fully across every term condition detail of all those contracts. And rather than pick out all the salient points that they need to uh, subcontract or subcontractor, they just do the classic QS move of back to backing the um, the contract where they push all of the terms that they've agreed to onto their subcontractor in addition to the terms that they want to push to the subcontractor and you get this like cascading of paperwork down the supply chain and i remember being a subcontractor with a a multi-hundred million dollar subcontract package to 
uh, on a project many years ago where our, our head contract was over 3,000 pages long. For three months as a management team, I remember the conversation about trying to understand what our rights and obligations were under that contract and the thought of how we would even get to a spot where we could understand the rights and obligations of under the contract. Uh, and it ended up never happening. And so we would constantly find these situations where the managing contractor would say, "Page two thousand six hundred and forty-two says you're supposed to, do, you're supposed to do whatever we want here, here, here." There was probably fourteen spots that that was contradicted, but finding those spots was was uh, like needle in a haystack. The ability and the way that this could level the playing field for the smaller contractors, the ones where the the kind of shit gets pushed downhill towards them, I think is game changing if i was in construction on a project right now especially if i was on the receiving end of one of these contracts i'd be all over this yeah 100 percent. i still remember my first day um on a project and someone just said here's the works information read that and it was like <laughs> masses of paperwork right yeah. um looking into this tool from the point of view of the quantity surveyor it's nice to see finally a tool that actually you could imagine boosting productivity when mm-hmm. I left construction, the productivity boost was e-signatures, which isn't a productivity boost. It's doing something faster. <laughs> and it's not like you're sat there waiting for it to come back and not doing anything else. So like, you're not doing any more. Something just takes a bit longer. <laughs> Sorry, the fact um, that you said when you left construction was east. That was like when someone says, uh, when I left construction, the big productivity boost was mainframe <laughs> computers. Wait, it was wait, CAD, can- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I used P3 just, back in the day. I- <laughs> By the way, it wasn't that long ago. It's just they were so far behind in using e-signatures to every other industry. If we go back to if you're working on a subcontract package, you spend so much time reading through documentation, whether it's pre-contract signing. So you're actually negotiating a contract or trying to pull together a yeah. contract for the subcontractor to sign or managing that subcontractor through the life of the project. Yeah, there's what you've already mentioned, which is identify like risk provisions and understanding some of the complexity where you've got lots of terms across a document that may sort of counteract each other. And you're trying to form a view on where your position is, because as a QS and a main contractor, you want to get as back to back as possible with the supply chain below and the supply Mm -hmm. chain want to have a as safe a contract as possible and push back as much as they can. There are many times which would be unreasonable and unfair to push onto a subcontractor if those terms could cripple them over what could be like a mild mistake. So that stuff would be amazing. The ability to review and provide back that feedback in a tool that all of us have used things like ChatGPT to generate sort of summaries and to highlight aspects of um, a document. But then they go quite deep. So there's one part of the tool which it will basically review contracts or documentation against company standards at the mm-hmm. point out where like this isn't suitable because of X. So that's really cool. They've got another one, which is a playbook feature. So when someone joins a job, um, it runs training on like the contracts obligations and key provisions. So like- 100%, 100% like, game changer. That's amazing. 100%. Like, and that's the sort of stuff that <laughs> when you like pull together a subcontract, you give it to the commercial manager, they like flick to page seven and they go, that's fucking stupid. And they give it back to you. Yep. To just know like what you're aiming for for a junior member, even a senior member, and to have a playbook on like this is the key stuff for this project that like is minimum standard. This is the bar. If 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 you if you went and looked at any lessons learnt report for any major project, I'm sure <laughs> in there somewhere is a lesson learnt about teaching new starters the contract rights and obligations. Because as projects go on, there's always scope creep. They're always missing uh, opportunities. This the ability to uh, bring people up to speed instead of just giving them the 3,000 pages, which certain types of personas will go and read and internalize, but that's the minority. Yeah. Yeah. Game changer. Yeah, it's huge. And then there was, a, there was another part where at project completion, you can feed back information against the contract. So it identifies which areas of the contract were actually weak because of cost overruns. So you can then consider mm-hmm. that for future contracts. So mm-hmm. like, it's not just saying, do this, do this. It's actually taking that information back and going, cool, this didn't work, so next time you need to do X. Yep. So it's actually pointing out the vulnerabilities. The reason I'm so excited is like, we we know this works even at a really basic level. Like it's no secret, like internally within our company, we've been reviewing contracts and 
uh, insurance documents and all sorts, just using the standard models, whether it's like a, usually a Claude is the, the best. Uh, yeah. This is not a paid ad for Claude, but we've negotiated whole contracts using that. And then uh, when we need to kick in things to a real real life lawyer, the impact that that has on being able to understand what is market standard, where two clauses contradict each other, that's like in every construction contract. The biggest thing is you, people go to write these things and, I don't know, depending on the size of the contract, the team writing them is massive. They're not one person. Yeah, no one covers thing. more and like no one, yeah. yeah, and there's always contradictions littered through the entire thing. And half of the arguments that I've ever had on projects in trying to sort out the requirements of the project have been in openly contradictory terms throughout the contract. Yeah. Um, and so it definitely, something in this area definitely works. You can use it right now by just uh, using the, the out-of-the-box models. Yeah, I guess that leads to the the opposite uh, side of it. You know, as th- there's often this uh, knock on AI startups that they people always say that they're like a thin wrapper of an underlying model. You know, you're a bit of a UI on top of an open AI or an anthropic model. And I don't know that I totally agree, but that's a that's a that's a common knock on on most AI startups or many AI startups. And ultimately, they'll be doing something clever around how they're doing the retrieval, the storage, what techniques they're using, where for it to work well. But there is this paradigm that happens when you're trying to solve a problem like this or, you know, we've seen as well. You spend so much time getting the right, let's say, product market fit. What's the combination of interactions, behaviors, features that you need to have? And the question is, if they do invest that time, money and solve it and because I think it will be great. How easy is it for their own customers or a competitor to basically observe what the set and behaviors are and yeah. just use the the models to to make their own version of it without paying them? So that's going to be the interesting test around how tightly it can be integrated at the right at all the different levels that it can have an impact because if it's just we can review your document, Claude will do that yeah. pretty well now for like 20 bucks a month or whatever. Yeah, if anyone could just whitelist or white label one of the standard tools, do a little bit of work and then suddenly it spits out the right sort of answer in a bit of UI that makes sense to the audience, then yeah, you're in a difficult spot. And people will look at it because like they claim that you can reduce contract review by 80%. Oh, I never normally least. believe these big percentages, I, I percentages but I, I believe that you probably be, you could probably better that. Yeah. So when you start throwing in like market size numbers of construction, like people will take notice if, if they get mm-hmm. even a, a little bit of success. So you'd expect uh, a whole herd of followers pretty quickly. Um, Cause the, yeah, like the, the review of a contract and spotting you know, generating a rights and obligations or finding um, contradictions, those things, there's probably some techniques of how they feed that and prompt that uh, and and manage that data. I don't imagine that's wildly complex. The ability to observe some of the behavior of what's happening on the project and then surface when those things have contractual implications is really interesting like you could observe that there was a delay if you were integrated with the right set of tools observe that there was a delay so there's this kind of like observing workflows to go based on the contract or whatever that might be Yeah. yeah and then that kind of propagates or drafts the the early warning we use a tool at the moment uh, in our business where we have these kind of workflows set up. Something happens, it triggers it to go to a, an AI model, it writes something, pushes it over here, then goes over there. You could see how like each site diary, for example, should get checked and scanned and then an action off the back of it, for example. So yeah, there's, there's some bits of that which would be hard. You, you, it's hard to build without developers and good developers, et cetera. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really the interesting. idea that it understands hierarchy and relationships that must be a bit, I don't know if that is complicated or not because you probably just trained the model. The, or the, an interesting thing on the other side, I don't know if this applies in this case, but there's been a recently a bunch of news stories uh, that I was looking at this morning where companies are pausing rollouts of uh, Microsoft Copilot. Uh, this is kind of like a side note, but uh, it's because 
uh, Copilot and things like Slack's AI tool, you can very easily hack it around permissions. So documents that you're not supposed to have access to, you can get it to return information from those documents. Oh, really? Um, channels that you're not supposed to have access to. Because if you think about it, the model itself, in order to retrieve the information, has to have like broad permissions within the company's data set. And then it's trying to apply a level of control at the user level that's interacting with it. But if you play with the prompt, you can get it to you can get it to go beyond what you should have access to. And so that's causing like a bit of a pause in some companies rolling out Microsoft Copilot. This here, I think it would be easier because you're probably bounding it to mostly to the project and people that should have access to it. Yeah. Um, but if it's when they're going to like company playbooks or thinking about broader reviews. I don't think that's going to be as much of a problem in this case because most people on the project should have access to those documents. Anyway, that is super interesting. I would, uh, I can, there were so many hours, there's so many hours that I could have gotten back in my life if we could have had that 10 years ago. (laughs) God damn it. 100%. Okay, jumping on to the last topic. Uh, this is the topic of everyone in countries like the UK and Europe putting in resignation notices to transfer to Honolulu. In the news, the city of Honolulu has awarded the CCGS project, the City Centre Guideway and Stations contract for the Honolulu Rapid Transit System uh, to Tutor Perini, a, a general contractor. The project is worth, or the contract is worth 1.7 approximately billion USD uh, and is supposed to kick off late this year or early next year. Um, so it's essentially a light rail project with a number of stations running through the through Honolulu. You're all over this. You've been booking flights and looking at accommodation. What, are you, what have you found, mate? Yeah, I've got a demo in person next week to them, yeah. so I'm going <laughs> to zip over if that's all right. Yeah, really cool project. Obviously, it's a dream job for anyone who fancies three or four years in Hawaii. Um, you take it. The first thing is... billion pounds for three miles of rail with six stations is nuts. Now, I have no idea. I think that's island tax, mate. I think that's an island tax. Yeah, I was going to say, I have no idea the cost of shipping construction materials, which we assume are not produced on the island, to Mm -hmm. the island. So that's going to have a horrible effect. You probably have to relocate a lot of the workforce too. So there's going to be loads of costs that we just wouldn't be able to understand what that looks like. But if you look at London's DLI, it was like one and a half billion. It's pretty exp- expensive. It's like 30, 40 kilometers, 45 stations. It was built in the 80s, but... If yeah, I'm sure if you've done inflation, if you done inflation adjustment I did, on that. I did apply inflation and it takes it up to 1.5 billion. I think there's Is some it? costs missing there because that's great value. Uh, almost unbelievable. It's pretty much the equivalent, a driverless, Mm -hmm. above ground, elevated uh, light rail. So um, maybe the Honolulu tax is higher than the uh, the London tax, which is nice to hear. (laughs) No, I can't. Yeah, that's that's tremendous uh, value. The um, the contractor that's been awarded the project, Tudor Perini, I hadn't actually heard a ton about but they are that they're a large uh, general contractor yeah i i had no idea how big they were Um, yeah yeah yeah. four billion Um, revenue and eight thousand people yeah 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 and yeah based out of california had it was like like every construction contractor it's like the merger of two tudor and then perini from years ago uh, and had delivered projects like yeah the California high speed rail that we talked about a few weeks ago and the the awesome Hudson Yards project in New York I don't know if you've seen that but that's yeah yeah there's some awesome docos on on that um, on that project so the other thing is I wonder if we could get a tax um, deduction for travel to just in case any accountants are listening um, block your ears <laughs> uh, but yeah could you get a tax deduction for flying to I think so. Business expense. I'll meet you there. Is that, do you go the other that. way around? <laughs> you must do. The other way around? You go uh, over the Pacific, we, right? Yeah. Yeah, we could direct there. It's super close. <laughs> otherwise, so. it's, <laughs> otherwise, it's like doing a full... It's like, a, yeah, it'd be like not being able to turn left like Zoolander. It's like right there. <laughs> yeah. It'd be super weird to do a whole lap of the world just to get back there. Yeah, um, I just realized where it is. It's like halfway between you and LA, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really close. <laughs> Uh, it'd be a ter- it'd yeah. be a terrible you would have had a terrible mix up if you've done a whole round the world trip to get to to Hawaii from Australia. Yeah, um, I think we so have to it- mention their website. Do we? Um, I wasn't going. Yeah, <laughs> um, 
we've we've seen a lot of poor websites but this one's almost like a classic yeah, yeah picture yeah, like I, uh... like like yeah like 90 1999 amazon website the kind of that yeah. that kind of level very gray and even all the little the blocks have like the shadow on the right and the bottom like you had in Word yeah, yeah, back Microsoft, in the day. yeah yeah so a company that's valued at 10 billion pounds has what is now a five pound website which is impressive but uh hey they're still winning billion pound it's, jobs in hawaii so it's about cares? it's about the work you do not about the how jazzy your website looks <laughs> speaking yeah, of which we're absolutely. just doing some website work at the moment actually Carlos, so um yeah <laughs> cool Looking forward to uh, it. you should uh find out who built theirs and make sure it's not them <laughs> Uh, I think we're going to run up on time. So do you want to read us out? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for listening to this show. Um, If you did enjoy today's episode, please do like the video or follow us on your chosen podcast platform. Um, We really do appreciate your support and we'll see you next week. Thank you.